Hi folks. So we're going to continue the basic electronics series I'm doing here. And now we're going to go into components. Okay, there are many, many different components, scads of them. We're going to discuss the basic families, starting with the passive components, resistors, inductors, capacitors. And uh, then we'll go into the active components and all their families and subfamilies and sure tail relatives. Uh, there's a lot of different ones. Uh, the common ones we'll go into in detail. Uh, the more esoteric or rare ones, we will not go into as much detail. We'll discuss their basic functions and uh, pretty much leave it at that. There are some components I have never seen in the wild, so there's really no need to spend a lot of time on those. This series is going to go on for a long time as it is so i don't want to get bogged down in too much of the details so we're going to start our discussion with the resistor now the humble resistor whose symbol you've already seen i'm going to put it up here now but um it doesn't seem like a very exciting component not a very sexy component but without resistors there would be no modern electronics as we know it because if you stop and think about this Electronics is simply telling current where to go and when to go there. And without being able to control that current, and resistors are a big part of that, we would have no modern electronics. So the humble resistor is actually so important that we, we couldn't exist without it. And they're ubiquitous. We find them in virtually every piece of electronic equipment from uh, space, spacecraft to speaker crossovers, from cars to coffee makers. We find them in a lot of electrical systems. Um, and they can range in size from little tiny surface mount components to refrigerator sized load banks that are air or even water cooled. Um, we will talk about all the different types you'll see, uh, what their failure modes are, and what causes that. And uh, well, let's start and let's start this out by just looking at a couple and talking about them and uh, see where it takes us. Okay, so no discussion of any electronic component is complete without the discussion of the perfect component. Now, there are no perfect components in the real world. These are just models that we discuss. And it's helpful to know what a perfect resistor is so that we can see what the pitfalls are as we are designing or working with them. Um, for the most part, resistors just are resistors. They resist the flow of current. But once we start going up in frequency, and we're going to have to have a discussion of frequency, uh, once you start going up, all kinds of things can come into play. Because a resistor, while it's simply a device like this, um, as you go up in frequency, the tiny amounts of capacitance and inductance that you have inherent in virtually any device that has conductors, uh, they come into play and they become critical. Now, where we live down in the audio or DC world, it's not really an issue. We don't have to worry about that. But know that this, this does exist. So that's why we have discussions of perfect components. We'll get more into that when we begin talking about inductors and capacitors. Again, where we live, it's not a critical issue. Now, all these capacitors that you see here are known as axial. And you'll come across the terms radial and axial when we discuss capacitors. Um, in some cases, uh, inductors that are made for uh, circuit board mounting or PCB mounting. But um, most of the resistors that we see are going to be axial. Occasionally, you'll see one where both the leads come out of the same end. And those are known as radial components. So when you go to order them, that's what all that means. Now, this is a 10 watt resistor. These are both half watt. Uh, they were just laying around on my bench because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. By nature, I'm a slob. I, I have to consciously remind myself to clean up between tasks or this bench would be a foot deep all the time. As it is, uh, I don't even want to see, show you what the rest of it looks like. Anyway, these have the values printed right on them. Okay, this one says 200 ohm. These, however, have a color code and the color code is 
fairly simple to understand. Goes from zero to nine with different colors for each value between zero and nine. And I'll put a little chart up here for this discussion. And I think I mentioned this in the past, but I learned the color code by accidentally dropping an assortment of resistors and having to pick them up one at a time, look at them and put them back into the right little drawer they came out of. Um, I'm not going to recommend that everyone do this, but when I was done with that, I knew the color code and I'm not joking one little bit. That's how I learned it. Um, the most common color code is the three band with a tolerance band and we'll discuss tolerance here in a moment uh, but the one percent resistors that are becoming more common have a four color code and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit because i'll be honest with you I, I still have to spend a little time looking at those but um anyway and the other problem is um a lot of the 1% resistors have blue bodies and I just can't see them without putting the visor on and half the time the ohmmeter is closer in the visor so I just measure them. There's nothing wrong with that. Just know that we have a tolerance. Each one of these has rated in how accurate it is to its stated value. That is what the term tolerance means. So this is a 10% which means it could vary 20 ohms either way. It's a 200 ohm resistor. Um, most of them are these days 1%, but it used to be commonly you would see uh, 5% and 10%. And the tolerance band was the last band on the resistor would be either gold, um, silver, or no tolerance band at all, which I believe was 5, 10, and possibly 20. I don't think I've seen them without the tolerance band. They're usually 5% or 10% in the older carbon composition resistors. And that's the next thing we need to talk about is what these guys are made out of. Now, usually these guys here are, are what they call wire wound. These, this one is a carbon film, but the older resistors with the dark brown bodies, and I may have one laying around here. Okay, here's one. These are usually carbon composition, which means it's just ground up carbon inside. These are a film. And the problem with the carbon comps is over time, they tend to drift upward. Resistors will never, all right, I'm gonna say rarely because somebody's gonna chime in and say, oh, I had one that actually drifted downward. And possibly if you get a high voltage across them and fuse some of the carbon, maybe they can, but by far, the failure mode you'll see is they either burned open, opened up, or have increased in value sometimes drastically. Now, there's a family of resistors known as fusible, which is exactly what it sounds like. They will um, open up if their current rating is exceeded, and their current rating is actually based on the wattage. So if you put too much current through a quarter watt resistor, it is fusible, it can open up, but sometimes they just increase in value, again, sometimes drastically. Um, Sansui used a lot of these in their stereos, and I come across them in the phono sections. A lot of them are supposed to be 81 ohms. They're sometimes two, three, four times that value. I've seen them drift up to the mega ohms. So this is something we need to watch out for. Now, if a resistor is opened or burned up, there's a reason for it. This does not happen for no reason. It happens because their current or wattage rating was exceeded. And usually that's because of something downstream from it, either shorting out or malfunctioning. So if you find a burned resistor and you decide you're just going to replace it, it's just gonna burn up again. There was a reason it burned up and you need to determine what that reason is. So these are a family of resistors that are called fixed resistors because their value is unchanging. So then we have the variable resistor. We see these as volume controls and stereos. 
Um, some newer equipment uses encoders and does not use a variable resistor like this, but then a lot of the vintage stuff I work on, this is what you're gonna see. Uh, basically what you have inside is a carbon track with a wiper that goes over it. Now this is the same thing, but this is a wire wound variant and the wiper goes over these very fine wires here. Okay, variable resistors come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, but they all do basically the same thing, and that is they are variable. That's hence the name. Um, I have resistors that I keep for stock. And just to give you an idea, this is just the quarter watt to one watts. I have them all in uh, these little coin envelopes with values written on them. Uh, makes it easy to find them, keep them organized. I think I mentioned I'm a slob. Organization is not my thing, but uh, anyhow, you can see I can find just about every value I need. And that brings us up to another point. There are standard values of resistors. We start at 1 ohm, 1 1.2, 1.5, 1.8, 2.2. Um, I'm gonna have to look into this, and this is one reason I enjoy doing these basic series, is I will come up with things like this that I don't know the answer to. For instance, here's 4.7 ohms, not five, 4.7, not 4.5, 4.7. We see the same thing in capacitors. Some of you guys have a better background in math than I do, can probably explain this, but the point is, if we look at capacitors, electrolytics, or low values, we may have one microfarad, and then 2.2, 4.7, 3.3, just like these resistors. Now the resistors also fall between there, but there's a reason, and I will discuss it in a future video because I should have thought to look that up, but I didn't. The other thing you'll see is that resistors will have a different appearance depending on what their um, function is. And when I say function, I see these are flame proof. The bodies are kind of a matte gray. Let me take this out of the envelope so you can see what they look like. Okay, they have kind of a flat or matte gray finish to them. Contrast those with um, these. These tan bodies are carbon film. And then we have our 1% metal film. That's these guys with the blue bodies. So their appearance can tell you a lot about what the resistor is or does. Let me put this back in. Got to try and stay organized, even though it's not really my thing. The other thing we talk about is the wattage. Now, generally, when we're replacing a resistor, we're replacing it with the same wattage. And sometimes we can tell by looking, and sometimes we can't. We have to go by a service manual or, or schematic marking. But you need to get at least the same wattage. Now you can use a larger wattage resistor in a circuit that calls for a smaller value. You can put a half watt in where a quarter watt goes. And in fact, some of the newer half watt resistors look like quarter watt and it kind of screwed me up the first time I saw that. But it's fine to do something like that. A one watt resistor will withstand one watt so you can use it in a circuit that is designed for a half watt with no issues. However, you cannot go the other way. You can't use a half watt resistor in a circuit that a one watt resistor is called for because you will exceed the current rating and it will eventually malfunction. There are other things that we talk about when we're getting into resistors. Some are flame proof, which is uh, what these guys are. Um, the fusible ones, I believe, look like the flame proof. They have kind of that matte body. And then there are things like uh, temperature coefficient, um, which I don't really want to get into because it's not something we deal with a lot. Um, we have variants of the resistor, such as the varistor or the thermistor. Varistors are used in not power strips. They have metal oxide varistors. They're good for withstanding um, voltage surges. So they, that's why they put them in there as surge arresters. And then the thermistor is something that we will come across. They're usually um, 
disc-like devices that look like ceramic disc capacitors. Um, they're very small and usually they will have a rating and they will have a coefficient either a negative temperature coefficient or a positive temperature coefficient. And what that means is that the negative ones will have an inverse value as the temperature of the device goes up, the resistance goes down. The positive temperature coefficient, if the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up. So they will be rated at room temperature and either NTC or PTC, depending on which way the coefficient goes. So, I know I'm leaving a few things out, so I'm either going to move on to the next topic or I'm going to come back and add on to this video. Guess we'll see. I did remember one thing I wanted to discuss and that was shunt resistors. Now shunt resistors are precision resistors, usually a very low value that current goes through and we will measure the voltage drop across the shunt and that will tell us what the current going through it is. Now, right now we are looking at the shunt that is in my fluke. You've seen me use this fluke many times. I am looking across the 10 amp shunt inside the resist, inside the meter, and it's reading about 0 0.037 ohms. Now, if I move this around, these terminals are not clean so we will get a little bit of variation. But basically, this is how your meter measures current. Everything goes through the shunt inside the meter, and the meter reads the voltage drop across the shunt. Um, I work in telecom. We, everything in the telecom central office runs on 48 volt DC. They have just racks and racks of batteries. And it's not unusual to see DC plants put out thousands of amps, and every one of those amps flows through a shunt. The shunt's usually up in the racks above in the bus bars, and you'll see a point where everything goes through one big copper shunt. And I'm gonna show you a picture of one up here. And the shunt will be rated in hundreds or thousands of amps, and usually, the voltage rating will be in the millivolts. A uh, full scale 800 amp shunt would yield 50 millivolts. And they, they specified this because that was the rating of the analog meters that were put in panels many years ago. Um, I just wanted to bring this up. There are a lot of different reasons we use resistors, and this is one I just wanted to discuss. Okay, so I'm going to stop this video here. I don't like them to run on too long, as you know. Um, I'm going to do the next one on inductors, and that's going to be a pretty involved subject. So let me just sign off here. And as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Thanks a lot, folks.